stay If you win it Comes and goes in a minute Where's the real stuff in life To cling to Love Everybody, it's Larry Potesta with the Boomer Pod We have a very special guest today Miss Melissa Stubbs Who's a very important, if you will, stunt double and stunt coordinator. Melissa, thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, Larry. How are you doing? I can barely hear you. Can you turn your volume up? It's maxed, but uh, I can yell into the thing. Okay, I'll do the best that I can. How how did the career all start, Melissa? Um, so it was just a dream as a kid, essentially. My father taking me to live stunt shows, me watching far too much television as a kid. Uh, I was a little daredevil and had older brothers as the baby sister. You know, the original Bionic Woman, Charlie's Angels, the original TV show, those kind of things. And I just got the notion in my head, you know, I wanted to ride the horses and motorcycles and jump off the roofs. And um, I didn't want to do the acting part. I just wanted to do the action part. And uh, I just started, you know, that dream and then signed up as an extra and a stand in on some movies. And they were being shot in Canada. And uh, somebody was looking for somebody about my age. I was probably 17, 18 years old. Um, for this teen kind of murder movie, you know, Friday the 13th, Jason Tanks, Manhattan. And um, somebody recommended me to the stunt coordinator, Ken Kersinger and Kane Hodder, who was, they were both Jason at the time. Got killed three times and never looked back, never stopped working. We moved into stunt coordination by around 93. I was 23 years old. And then I moved into second unit directing and now I design and direct action. Tell us about Brad Lurie. He refers to you as Melly. Melly, yeah. So Brad and I go way back, back in the day. Um, Brad, you know, was one of the stunt actor guys, and we we met at a friend's house or something, and started working together. We did a couple projects together. Where we had a lot of. He was doubling the leading man. I was doubling the leading lady, and we were in some pretty hairy, precarious. Kind of, it's like romancing the stone meets moonlighting, kind of a thing called Adventure Inc., where this, you know, Sam and Diane kind of romance couple have to take out these rich people on adventures. And so Brad and I sort of got really stuck together. We we're attached by the hip, you know, relying on each other to keep each other safe and to have a good time. And our stunt coordinator had, had an interesting personality. So he and I were on our own, really. And, uh, yeah, we had, that's how I really got close with Brad. He plays um, Michael Myers in all the Halloween movies, of course. He's a, a big guy with some acting ability. and He was a very good stuntman and tough and hilarious. And uh, we've been friends for many years. Well, there are others that lovingly refer to you as a real badass. <laughs> how, do you feel, how do you feel about that? Well, I, I guess I wear it as a badge of honor because in our business, like, I don't want to be an actor. I don't need the, that sort of attention or fame or any of that. My gratification comes from my, my peers, the other stunt professionals, male and female. Those are the people that I want to impress because they're the real deal. And um, I want to earn their respect. Um, you know, not the directors and the big name actors. Couldn't care less what they think of me. But it's really the, the real stunt people. There's a code of honor, like a Navy SEAL or a Green Beret or Special Forces in the stunt world. These are real people doing real stuff. And, and we fly below the radar. We don't ask for attention or accolades. You just, you know, get down and dirty. So I guess if someone thinks I'm a badass, I'm honored. Um, I was just 
too dumb to say no. I didn't know any better. I would just, before I wouldn't ask and they'd be, Hey, I've got this. And I'd say yes. And then I would say, what are we doing? And, you know, it didn't matter. I would just go for it and try. And if I didn't have the skill at the time, I would go out and acquire the skill and train and rehearse and train and train and train until I could do it safely and efficiently. So that, you know, in the stunt world, we get our support and accolades from each other. Now, is there a softer side that you ever tap into? Oh, absolutely. I'm one of the most sensitive, empathetic people you'll ever meet. Very, when I'm stunt coordinating or directing second unit, I'm like the mother hen, you know, although I was a badass and I don't mind wrecking myself. I don't want any of my team or people that are working with me for me to be injured. It really upsets me. And um, I'm very, very sensitive. You know, animals are my soft spot. And, uh, you know, I'm your typical Aries, if you know anything about that, where you, you know, a leader, but yet very sensitive. How about your travels to Europe? You just got back, right? Yes, I just went to Saint Tropez um, for. A, Where did um, you go? So I have. Oh, I'm from the UK originally, from Liverpool, England, and my entire family are from the UK. And so all of the cousins, my mother had four brothers and sisters. So there's a lot of cousins around the world, and we all met in Saint Tropez. It was a delayed 50th birthday celebration. My cousin Daniel's 50th, which we were supposed to celebrate during COVID, but it got pushed. So he rented a big yacht and we cruised around, you know, the Côte d'Azur and we started in Saint Tropez and, and, uh, and we traveled to Spain and uh, had a great old time with the cousins and their kids. And it, This strike has been kind of a blessing where I could never make these things. I missed everybody's wedding and all the christenings and the funerals and the birthdays and the events because I was always working on a movie. Because when you're on a movie, you're owned. You can't just, oh, hey, I, I need a week. I'm going to San Tropez. So this strike, I'm using it as a blessing to do all these things that you normally don't have time to do. The calm before the storm, before all of this starts up again and we don't have time for all of the, the good times. I spent the last three years in Europe on three or four different movies, you know, in Dublin, in Belfast, in Bulgaria. Um, so I've been in Europe basically for the last three years, you know, through COVID. And uh, it's been kind of an interesting journey. And you went to Mallorca? Palma de Mallorca, yes. My, my cousin Daniel, they are from, Man they live in Manchester, England. They have a home there. So before coming back to the States, we hopped over to Palma and uh, went and spent a few days over there. It's a beautiful island. And how about, how about Monaco? Yes, we, we went to Monaco, went up to the village, the ancient village of Ez, which is a beautiful place. My mother and I used to go up there my father was on the world travel board and his head office was in Monaco. So I used to pop over there, you know, in between jobs and I could get away for a week or so. So it was, you know, my mom is in memory care now. So I went up to Ez because I remember going there with my mother and I called her from there. And it's one of the things she did remember was being in Ez with me at uh, Chateau Ez. Um, it's just above Monaco and about 30 minutes away from Nice up in the mountains. It's beautiful, a beautiful, unique place. And why did you choose a British accent to put on your IMDb? I can do a British accent? Why did I choose that? Because it's, it's one of the few accents I can do efficiently because you, my parents left there when I was an infant, so I wasn't raised in England, but my, my dad was a Scouse, my mom was a Scouse, all my cousins in their very thick British accents. And um, so that's something that I can, you know, if I needed to be a British special agent or some kind of character that has, says a few words and gets killed, because I have no desire to act, which 
<laughs> sometimes it comes to you and you have to take these roles because it requires your physical abilities as a stunt professional and acting ability, you know? So um, I chose British accent because I could fold into that quite easy. I was raised with it. Now, how about the movies? What does an action designer do? So an action designer is, is it's a fancy word that we've developed for stunt coordinator. Uh, action designer, second unit director. So you're on a big film, let's Mission Impossible is popular today or Cocaine Bear that I did. So Liz with Banks directs all the dramatic scenes, the actors talking and I fill in the blanks for all the action sequences. So the second unit director shoots the action sequences, you know, the bear chasing the ambulance or in Mission Impossible, my, my mate Wade Eastwood was the action designer, second unit director on that. And what we do is take the script, the written word and the story and the character and you develop action based around the character and to push the story forward to create an, an exciting roller coaster ride for the audience. And it depends, you know, you sometimes design action based from the location because it was written by a very creative writer in a, you know, an apartment in Hollywood somewhere. And they might, they've never actually been in jeopardy in a motorcycle chase or fallen off a building, or they've never been in a real fight in their life uh, or running across rooftops in, on leaping from one building to the next. They, it's all in their imagination. And as an action designer, we have to take story and character and create the action based on their written word. And often we change it quite a bit to suit the locations or the schedule or the budget or the ability of your lead actors, because you can train them to a certain extent, but if they get hurt, the movie shuts down. So you have to design safe action that is repeatable and is believable for the character, you know, the character's background and their journey and so that's basically what an action designer and you design the action. Now in 2011, you won a Screen Actors Guild Award for your work on Inception. Mm -hmm. That was a very creative movie. Can you tell me how that went? Well, that, that was all Christopher Nolan's, you know, um, ideas and his stunt coordinator, Tom Struthers at the time, you know, hires a team of people, stunt riggers, stunt performers, stunt drivers, and he brings a team together who execute the action. So really it's Christopher Nolan's, you know, brilliant mind that came up with all of that, all of those sequences. And he, he likes to confuse the audience. He likes to make people think. I remember one day just overhearing a conversation with he and Ken Watanabe and the director of photography trying to, and I think Leo DiCaprio was there on, um, and Ellen, now Elliot Page. And they were trying to make sense of what we were doing. And he said, it doesn't matter at this point, the audience isn't going to have a clue what's going on. So don't overthink it. So that was, you know, Nolan's, um, I was just part of the ensemble on that team, uh, on the stunt team. And in 2013, for your work in The Dark Knight Rises, you were nominated for another Screen Actors Guild Award. How was it to work on Batman? It was a trip. It was a trip. I doubled a couple of characters on there. Thomas Struthers and his wife, Cy Holland, brought me on and had me double the, the leading ladies. And again, Christopher Nolan film. He's a very tough man to work for. He's a bit like Jim Cameron. He knows everybody's job. He's very intelligent. He works harder than everybody and he expects the best from you. And we were in, we did some in Los Angeles, Dark Knight Rises, and most of it in Pittsburgh, where Chris Nolan and the team, they basically purchased, you know, most of downtown Pittsburgh and covered it in snow. And Nolan likes to do everything practically, so he doesn't use visual effects whenever possible. He hates visual effects. He wants everything raw and real. And that was the challenge on that. But he doesn't want cell phones on set. Yeah, I remember jumping into the tank one day and I, the uh, one of the vehicles I was driving and I had a cell phone in my back pocket. 
he took it out of my pocket and said, you aren't leaving this and just took it away from me because <laughs> he just hates that. He doesn't use a cell phone. He doesn't use a computer. And um, he's an interesting guy. He's very smart. You have to be poised and ready for anything. And you better not screw up because he doesn't have the time or patience to deal with mediocrity. You know, he's a, he's a great filmmaker. He's a brilliant man. And he expects the best from people. And tell me about Christian Bale. Oh, my God. What an incredible actor. Um, I first saw him in Empire of the Sun, Spielberg's film, when he was just a young boy. And if you look at it today, it's just timeless. His performance is just, I think he was 10 years old. And it probably took a year to shoot the film. Uh, but what an incredible performance. That is one underrated actor. Like he is... N- the nicest guy, a professional, no bullshit. He works very hard. You know, I watched he and Tom, who played Bane, uh, train every day to get huge. You know, although they got the bat suit on and the muscle suit, they are shredded under there. They just, they beef themselves up, worked really hard. I cannot say enough great things about Christian Bale in my observation. Um, he's, you know, a phenomenal talent. Well, in my opinion, he was the best Batman of all, of all, and I enjoyed every one of those. Now, 2016 was a busy year for you. Was it? <laughs> Let's talk about Suicide Squad with Margot Robbie. Oh, yeah, it's all a blur. Um, so, you know, I had the last, say, 15 years I've been stunt coordinating, and the last five years I've really only been directing, but every once in a while, because it's hard to find experienced stunt women who can ride a motorcycle or drive a car proficiently. That is a rare, you know, talent. Um, that is so sometimes I'll go and work for my friends or say, Hey, I've got this motorcycle thing. You're a great double for Margot Robbie. Would you come out? And uh, I'm absolutely. So they flew me to Toronto and I just did some, the motorcycle sequences for her. There was other stunt doubles for the other parts of it and I came up with an interesting concept as motorcycle gag just laying the bike down and surfing it um just a sexy interesting way for her to get the Joker's attention uh, because she's in love with the Joker and um that was a pretty cool experience it was cold freezing and I was wearing a silk blouse and basically no helmet and this challenging one but Margot Robbie is very impressive that actress. She's, she's just full of life, humor, talent. Like what a what a gem. I haven't seen Barbie yet, but I'm excited to see her work in that. I think she's just killing it. And she deserves every bit of success. Now after a 10-year break, Matt Damon does a reboot of Jason Bourne. Yes. What can you tell me about that work? Well, that is Simon Crane and um, Mr. Powell, um, Gary Powell. Uh, they were, Simon Crane was the second year director. Gary Powell was a stunt coordinator. Those guys came up in the business together, you know, and they, they're like brothers. They fight. It's hilarious. But they're both very good. And it was cool to see these two these two very strong personalities working together and designing those car sequences. Again, I was just a hired gun on that. I was one of the stunt drivers and we shot that in Vegas. So Simon and Gary designed this epic car chase. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's pretty amazing what they pulled off together. Um, And it was a car chase. They owned the Las Vegas strip for three weeks from the Aria all the way down to Bali's and they, we would own the streets from say 10 at night till seven in the morning. But you know, Vegas at night is a pretty interesting place. There's drunk people running across the street. So you, you had to be ready. You know, I think there was a JLo concert on a couple of those nights. So you the fans come out and you're just at the ready to just, you know, not hit anybody. And uh, while they're doing this hairy car chase with the, I think it was a Ford, some kind of Ford Mustang. I can't, or a Dodge uh, against a armored truck. And um, 
that sequence was quite impressive. I thought those guys put something very special together. And then there was Deadpool with Ryan Reynolds. Yes. That was an unusual part for him to play based on his other uh, endeavors. What can you tell me about that movie? I know he hated wearing the suit. Um, but yeah, Deadpool 1 and 2, David Leach directed the second one. Who's David Leach is an old friend and colleague of mine. David used to double Brad Pitt. We worked on Mr. and Mrs. Smith together and a few other things. And David is now a big time, very successful director. And he directed Deadpool 2. Um, but Ryan is like, oh my, what a great, he's Canadian, man. Like, come on, so am I. He's a great guy. And uh, I can tell you, he hated wearing that suit. But he found this young Russian kid from the circus who had just immigrated to Canada. And who's basically, whose name is Alex Kivitkovich. He and his girlfriend were basically living in their car and training parkour and whatnot. And so he was a, a tricker, this, guy, this kid, Alex. And he could move really well in the suit. So he got hired as one of the doubles. And he still, Ryan brings him everywhere with him today. So it's a bit of a rags to riches story where Alex, whenever Deadpool's in the suit, it's Alex. Because Ryan really hates wearing the mask and everything. So, but another hardworking, funny, funny, talented actor, Ryan Reynolds. Now there was an unusual film that you were a stunt coordinator for, for the pilot, The Assignment. Oh yeah. Ken Kersinger was in that movie you, and you worked with him before, is that right? Yeah, he and I are close. He was the first stunt coordinator to hire me when I was just a kid, so. You know, he was the first guy to give me a chance. Ken, Ken and I are very close, good friends. Um, we were doing that. Um, I'm trying to remember the director's name. He wrote Aliens and um, Walter Hill. Walter, Walter Hill wrote this. He also wrote Aliens and um, a few uh, Warriors. He directed Warriors, the original. So Walter Hill was directing and I was his stunt coordinator. What a phenomenal man to work with just a legend and a man named michael dope mike dope was playing the role of sigourney weaver's let's call it a love interest and he had a con conflict in his schedule so suddenly the, the the producer ken and john lind who was also the first ad came to me and they're like we're losing mike we need a guy tomorrow and i'm like what about he needed a stunt actor and i'm like you know, Ken is a fantastic actor. He also played Jason in the Friday the 13th movies. And so they brought Kenny in and put him in a costume and he was on camera the next day to take over the role. So he played, that was a very interesting script. Um, it, it was shot as, I think Tommy Boy or something was a working title with Michelle Rodriguez playing both the male and female roles. And Walter Hill was able to get Sigourney to come out because they're old friends from Alien and uh, convinced her to come and do this film with him. And so we had no money. I think we had $4 million to make the movie. And it came out as the reassignment or the assignment, something like that. Um, and I don't know how well it turned out, but the script was fantastic. And um, it was a very cool experience to work with Walter Hill and Kenny Kersinger my old buddy and Kenny's wife actually was uh, our costumer on the show. So it was a bit of a family affair. We shot it in a mental hospital somewhere outside of Vancouver. Well, as we did with Brad Lurie, we interviewed Ken Kersinger. He's a very interesting guy. Oh, he's, and, I love that man. And a very sincere guy. Yeah. He's legit. Yeah. I owe my career to that guy. He was, he opened, he opened doors for me. He was very, good to me like a big brother. Okay, let's ratchet up to 2018 in the X-Files. You were a stunt coordinator there, I believe for eight episodes. Now, David Duchovny played somewhat of a different role than he did in his popular series, Californication. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with both performances? 
Of course. You know, it's David's birthday today. Happy birthday, David. August 7th. Um, so I worked on the original pilot of the X-Files. Uh, Brad Lurie and I were also doing Adventure Inc. at the same time. So I was doing both shows at the same time. Ken Kersinger was the stunt coordinator on the pilot of the X-Files. I doubled Jillian Anderson. So that was 25 years ago or more. And then here we are again, Chris Carter is revamping the X-Files. He wrote, it was pre-streaming. It was the very start of streaming where now eight episodes is quite a normal thing where you just create eight one hour movies essentially. So Chris Carter came in and he wanted to do eight more. And so we got the band all back together. And it's, now I'm not just Jillian's stunt double. I'm now the stunt coordinator and Chris Carter's wing woman, per se, and second unit director. So I designed the car chases and it was a different role for me, but it was the same team. It was like getting the band back together. Like Jillian and David were just fantastic and great moods, you know, back in the day with X-Files. It was a... It was a rough go for them. They were doing 22 episodes a season. They had no breaks. And it was all nights and in the rain. And it was very arduous. It was a slog making that many episodes. So they had time to come full circle. It was such a great experience bringing, you know, just only doing eight of them. So you don't have time to get sick of anybody or annoyed with anybody because you're only in it for eight. <laughs> and so David's performance you know, in this new one, he, he took on, like, he had all these more skills, you know, he had fights that he never had in the originals. Cause I was like, Chris to Chris Carter, you, where did Mulder acquire all these, these, you know, military fight combat skills. And uh, David said, well, I learned it in Quantico and I've been on a, a side journey since you last saw me, you know, and I'm like, okay, well, all right. But so his performance was very different. He, he enjoyed it. He loved doing fight choreography. It's, you know, he's always having to do very heavy, deep, you know, verbose dialogue sequences. Um, so I think he really enjoyed the more, you know, doing more action. And uh, it was a very different role from kind of Californication. But it, he is, he's a great guy. We, we still stay in touch. Let's go to something a little more current. 2020, Big Sky. Mm -hmm. You did the pilot as yeah, pilot coordinator. First. Yeah. What can you tell me about that series? Well, Big Sky, we were right in the middle of the pandemic. I, In March, the early March, I was doing a Sandra Bullock movie called The Unforgivable. And we were shooting that in Vancouver, funnily enough. And then suddenly we got a memo and said, we're shutting down for two weeks. We're going to re we're doing a hiatus to we'll be see in two weeks. None of us knew it was going to be three years, the COVID thing. Um, so I had, you know, we were all on a hiatus trying to figure out what it is to do with our lives. It was like a retirement rehearsal. And a young lad whose father I used to work for as a producer, he, he was a producer. Cecil O'Connor reached out to me and said, Hey, we're, we're going to try to make a show during the pandemic. Are you in? We're going to shoot at Vancouver. It's called Big Sky. And uh, my friends, one of my best friend's daughters, Natalie, was played a role in it also. And uh, I said, yeah, I'm in. So we started prepping in June of 2020 via Zoom. None of us knew how we were going to make a show with masks and not being able to be in the same room and all this. It, none of us knew how to do it anymore because we couldn't meet in person. We couldn't be in close quarters. There was all these COVID safety protocols that were put into play. So in August, we started having in-person meetings and I had to do fight rehearsals because there was fights in a, a container and we had three cameras, which, you know, that's focus puller and a camera operator in each camera and five characters inside a truck container. So it's all the things you're not supposed to do during COVID. So it was a very challenging time that August um, September, learning to shoot the, in the new way, the new, the new way of life, the new COVID way with masks on and glasses. You can't hear each other. Everything's muffled. You can't see because your glasses are fogged up. And, you know, rehearsals were very difficult to get done. Somehow we were able to 
make it happen. And so it was an interesting journey to do. So I did that and two, and then I uh, ended up leaving for New York to go to the Equalizer with Queen Tifa. Now, Dee Dee Pfeiffer was one of our guests on a previous podcast. Did you get an opportunity to interact with her at all? A little bit. What a, what a phenomenal lady. Um, she didn't have any action per se. It was mostly dialogue sequences in their detective agency in the, in the small town of Colorado where we're was supposed to be. So, you know, we, had, we, we talked occasionally, but she really wasn't involved with any action or fights or you know, anything like that to sort of where I come in, where I'm sort of like the coach and the fight trainer and the keep everybody safe to teach them how to do things and help them develop their character per se from a physical mental aspect. So I didn't have a lot to do with Didi. If you had to give us a list, what would be at the top of your greatest achievements in your career? Oh my gosh, still being alive being able to walk. <laughs> um, uh, uh, uh. I can go for a run and I'm thankful after all the bones I've broken. Uh, I think one of them, I mean, X-Files was such a huge part of my life from, you know, the past 25 years. And it's a show that, you know, my aunties and uncles in England would have watched and heard of. So, so suddenly I was cool um, <laughs> to my family. But uh, I think The Last Samurai was one of my most fulfilling, challenging, interesting journeys with Tom Cruise. Uh, I was a stunt coordinator, second unit. Nick Powell was a second unit director, fight choreographer. Phenomenal talent, Nicholas Powell. Um, so I learned a lot from him. Um, I like to choreograph fights with my level. He's a, he's a sword master also. He, Choreographed the fights for the original Gladiator, Braveheart. Um, he was a stunt coordinator on the original Born Identity. He's a, a, a talent. I learned so much about fight choreography and sword work and how to shoot fights from him. It was an educational journey. It was very challenging. We shot in LA, Tokyo, and New Zealand for five months. And taking Brad Pitt, or Brad Pitt, sorry, Tom Cruise from never picking up a sword in his life and not really knowing how to fight at all. Um, to what he was able to become, you know, in the, the, the Ronin fight in downtown Tokyo and all the battles. And like, that's a quick learner, that guy, a very dedicated actor. His work ethic is just blow anybody away. Maybe Hugh Jackman could, you know, give him a run for it. That guy's work ethic is insane. Um, so I say last time I was probably, or Mr. and Mrs. Smith, perhaps, was an incredible experience and journey and something that I'm super proud and excited to be a part of, you know, Simon Crane and Wade Eastwood's team on that. Uh, I just, you know, was a double for An Angie on that. So many great things, you know, and I was pretty proud of School for Good and Evil to be able to be Paul Feig's uh, confidant and an extension of him, you know, he handed all the action in second unit to me. And I can't say Paul Feig is the nicest man in the industry ever and a talent. And so to be able to do that film in Ireland with him was like, if I never do another movie, I was, I was happy just to be able to do that with him. Now, how about challenges, especially currently? So, yeah, I mean, we're on strike right now and I'm not used to sitting. I'm terrible. Like I have to train every day. I have to learn new things. I have a just need and a thirst to learn. Um, and right, you know, I became a lifeguard for giggles. I did a film in Dominican Republic. I doubled Jodie Foster and Ed Benning about a woman who swam from Cuba to Florida, the Diane Nyad story. I've never been a swimmer. I love the water. I'm a surfer. Uh, I've done tons of scuba underwater work, but I've never been a long distance swimmer. So I became a long distance swimmer, which led in, you know, I got my lifeguard certification and, and I just got a drone. Now I'm learning to be a drone pilot. Now I might, you know, dive into the pool of, depending on how long this uh, strike lasts, learn to fly helicopters. And uh, 
I've been thinking about going to a rally car school, just doing some tune up rally car racing. And uh, yeah, there's so many things I still have to learn as a filmmaker. I, I'm always studying editing and learning. I just, I just want to direct films now. So that's sort of where my focus will go it, more and more just directing. And what are your thoughts about the strike? Um, I think it needed to happen and I'm glad we're doing it. I know a lot of people, you know, I'm in a good position where I've been very smart with my money. I didn't just buy toys and squander it away. I bought properties and I've been smart with my money so I can sit this out forever. But a lot of people are in really bad positions where they have families to feed and uh, they have mortgages to pay. And, you know, we all have mortgages, but they're in a very bad position. So I hope for their sake, it doesn't last long. Uh, on the heels of COVID, where the world shut down, it really it, it killed everybody. So everybody's just recovering from the lack of work during COVID. And now here we go again. But it needed to happen. You know, this, the when the original deals for writers, directors, and SAG players were created, um, was like webinar stuff. It, it, the internet wasn't fast enough to stream shows. And so that's when all these deals were made. So now it's time... We don't see residuals anymore. Like all these things you see on Amazon, Netflix, Paramount Plus. Like this is, there's not that many feature films being made or network television anymore. It's all about streaming and selling streaming memberships. And we collectively as SAG players don't see any residuals from that. We get nothing. You get your daily paycheck and that's it. Nothing for the future. So we have to do this fight right now and stick, stick our heels in and say, hey, we, we need to get the residuals from these shows, just like a theatrical-based film. And also the AI aspect of it, where they can take our likeness, our voice, our movement, and create it. And, you know, we do a, um, a performance capture, um, mo motion capture performance, and they own it, and we'll never see a penny from that. And they can just create humans and movement and action from that. So it's, it's a really crucial time to, to sit back, dig our heels in and fight for, you know, for the future, for the younger generations. Because if we give it all away now, we're, you know, we'll have killed everything that people fought before us to get. You know, a simple airline ticket to be, or a hotel or decent accommodations when they take, fly you somewhere to work. So it's, it will end. I don't know how long it's going to last, maybe six months, maybe January, maybe two months. But in the end, it's going to be so insanely busy because no one's making anything right now. So for a few independent, it's another thing. It's good for independent pictures because they're not striking against independence. So maybe some good movies will finally get made. And nothing against Marvel or all those big franchises, but they're rehashing the same crap over and there's nothing new. All these good independent scripts aren't getting made um, because they're being crushed by the big monster budgets. So maybe we'll see some different art house kind of cool independent filmmaking, some nice stories uh, come out of this. And once the strike is over, the floodgates, are, it's going to be insanely busy. I, I think everybody just, you know, not panic, just sit this out. It's going to be fine. It just like through COVID, it was busier than ever. And we will be have to make an insane amount of content once we are not, you know, once we're able to get the green light to work. Any disappointments of note, Melissa? Any disappointments? Mm -hmm. of, in myself or? Yeah. Sure. Um, I remember one night on Dark Angel, it was my birthday, my 30th birthday, and Jim Cameron was directing. And I had to wheelie this motorcycle off into the moonlight. And I couldn't get the bike to, to wheelie. It just wouldn't. It kept spinning out. And, and I had rehearsed. I was ready. I was going to nail it. Jim Cameron's directing. And, just, and I couldn't get the damn thing to wheelie. And I blew, burned the clutch out. I wanted to kill myself. I wanted to slip my wrists. And I beat myself up for probably five years about that and uh i could blame the motorcycle but i think i i just screwed up but there's those things where people are like are you afraid and i'm like no not at all are you afraid of being hurt I'm like no i am afraid of disappointing someone 
I am afraid of not getting the shot that I said I could do. And that is my greatest fear to disappoint. So there's, you know, things like disappointments like that are, you know, are that I don't want to disappoint anybody ever or fail, but failure is good. You can't be afraid to fail because that's when you get, that's where you grow the most in your darkest failures. What can you tell me about your family? My family. So my family, my, my mother and father are from Liverpool, England. That's where I'm from. Uh, my father passed away when we were in the middle of making X-Files. Uh, I was holding his hand until he took his last breath. That guy was a legend. Funniest man on the planet. Take Burgess Meredith and um, Dudley Moore in the movie 10. And that's kind of my dad or Arthur. He was quite a character. And my mom is still with us. Lovely British lady. She's living in memory care. And uh, I'm going to go see her. Uh, fly up to Canada and go see her this week. And my stepfather passed away when I was in the middle of, he was an amazing man, Arthur Leonard Taylor. I had two dads which raised me. Fun dad, Leonard Stubbs, who was like my college roommate. He was like an old sea, he was a pirate, sailed on ships and he was my college buddy. And my stepfather, who was the businessman, the logical one, I used to say, oh, here goes another lecture, the boring one, but he kept my brother and I on track and kept our family together. So I had the greatest combination of two fathers. And I lost my, my stepfather land in, uh, when we were in the middle of making cocaine bear. And uh, so now it's, and I have two brothers and uh, I live, you know, this, I'm becoming an orphan pretty. It's an interesting conversation I had with my cousin Daniel and my other cousins they'd all lost their parents in the last couple of years and like well we're orphans now so hopefully my mom will stick around for a while anything else you'd like to comment on or pitch um I'd say if you want a best friend get a dog your dog will my dog travels all around the world with me. The only one I can count on. <laughs> and leave the room, leave a person better than you found it. When you walk That's into true. a room, leave it better. When you meet a person, engage with them, whether you love them or you don't, or it's just a friendship, leave a room, leave a person better than you found them. That's wonderful. I want to thank you for such a wonderful conversation. Well, thank you, you well for talking to me. Good luck with this strike. Thank you. Good luck with everything that you're doing. And I can't wait to uh, hear more of your podcast. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Take care, man. And you will be happy too.